families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello and welcome to Families Divided. This week, Chris Turner shares with you in the first of a two-part series on mild, moderate, and severe alienation. There are many people living in mild alienation and don't even realize this is happening in their families. I hope you'll be with us tonight and pay close attention to what she has to share with you. I also sat down with Despina Mavridou in Greece and shared some information with you on the book she wrote after she herself was an alienated child for 20 years. First, we'll have these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision-making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being, too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. In families dealing with alienation, communication during conflict is often very difficult. This fall, Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, will present a special in-person conference to address that very issue. Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills will be held September 9th through the 11th at the Marriott Research Triangle Park in Durham, North Carolina. You'll learn from experts how to master skills that can reduce anxiety, anger, and stress in alienation situations. Join event director Elaine Cobb, the founder and president of Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights, and conference moderator Dr. Colleen Murray as they present a lineup of highly respected experts, including keynote speaker Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, plus presentations by Bill Eddy, Megan Hunter, Dr. Joshua Coleman, Dr. Mark Mosk, Dr. Mary Alvarez, Dr. Sue Cornbluth, Shazia Sparkman, and Lisa Rothfuss. Mark your calendar now, September 9th through the 11th, for Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills, hosted by Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, Steel Partners Foundation, and PAICA, Parental Alienation is Child Abuse. Visit familyaccess.info for more details on the conference and secure your attendance. Seating is limited. to be here today. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about mild, moderate, and severe levels of, of alienation. We're going to talk a little bit about some case studies. Um, and so just to kind of get started, I have a couple of things I just want to introduce. Um, that uh, parental alienation is not always easy to see as it begins in a family. Often it's noticed in the midst of a very emotional transition. Many times things start during divorce, separation, remarriage, a new child, any transition. And so we kind of excuse it away of little signs that maybe things are just a little more emotional during those transitions. We normalize much of the early behaviors associated with alienation as normal for families in conflict. And often the underpinnings of a child refusing, resisting, or rejecting, which we also deem as parental alienation, a parent begins, may begin with, within the intact family. 
So many times these, these kind of situations happen and the underpinnings of alienation growing and escalating may happen even when families are together. For example, I had a family um, that was in the midst of a divorce going through the process. And as we began to talk about what was going on with the family and where the children would live and how things were, I discovered that um, the mom and the dad, and they had two children, two teenagers, Mom was living in the house with her children who were often sharing a room with her. Dad was kind of banished to an apartment above the garage. So he wasn't even allowed in the home. Her lifestyle was not gonna change. She was demanding that he pay for everything. And yet he was still wanting to save his marriage, which was to me was kind of um, eye-opening that he wasn't even able to see that he was already taken out of the family. Um, and so mom had already aligned with kids. She had a little intact family and dad was just an add-on who provided support. So even if the family is still together and still intact, there can be signs and very clear signs from the outside that um, that rejection of one parent has begun. But when do those angry barbs and the litigation game and the parents and anger strikes cross over into parental alienation? When is it just a normal process and everyone says that divorce is the worst thing that they've gone through? You know, when does all of that escalate to the point where we actually call it parental alienation? We look to the kids for that answer. When do those passive aggressive acts and mild use of tactics turned into moderate alienation and then possibly into severe alienation? Is it inevitable that all mild cases will escalate to the point where they're severe if left unchecked? We're still trying to discover the answers to those questions. Is there always pathology in those severe cases? Is there a reason why these things are happening and escalating? We're working to explore, research, define, and measure the input that we have. So stay tuned, I'm sure we'll have more as, as time goes on and we follow these cases more. But today we're going to explore the three levels and or the three degrees of that alienation, mild, moderate, and severe. And specifically the common understanding of what the term is. We're gonna talk about the characteristics in the children that we see during each of these levels. Some of the interventions, or we call them resets, um, of how you reset your family so that those interventions take hold and common missteps in each of these levels. First, some common, uh, common ground um, that, as, that I want to understand as we begin, I begin my discussion. The first and foremost is PA is real. Parental alienation is a real thing. And I know that not all people in the field of social work, of therapy, and in the legal field believe that, but parental alienation is real. Secondly, I to wholeheartedly agree with Loranda Bernay, who wrote in their book in 2020, parental alienation is a mental condition in which a child, usually one whose parents are engaged in high conflict, separation or divorce, allies himself or herself strongly with an alienating parent and rejects a relationship with a target parent without legitimate justification. So let's just talk, I just wanna clarify a little bit about that without, legitimate justification. It sets parental alienation apart from justified estrangement. And when we talk about the levels of parental alienation, mild, moderate, and severe, we're talking about the presence of distancing behaviors for no good reason. There hasn't been abuse, there hasn't been abandonment, poor parenting or inappropriate parenting hasn't been a problem, incarceration. So there's no good reason why there should be that. Although I will say, even in cases, of justified estrangement because of past abuse, abandonment, or incarceration, or some other thing that kept caused that um, separation and that distance between family members, there can still be the presence of alienation in the sight of that. For example, I have I have a family who um, had young a child when they were very young. Both of them were nineteen, and at the time they got together, they were using drugs, doing things probably that they shouldn't have been doing, um, and then getting ready to be parents. Uh, but they were both equally involved in some of those behaviors that were not um, good parenting. And so here we are, you know, six years later, the child is seven years old now, and they have not been together for five years. 
And mom and dad admit that they had a wild life earlier. They had used drugs. They had done some illegal things. Mom cleaned up her act and dad cleaned up her act. But mom continues to go back to the time prior to and judge dad based on past behavior and is creating and facilitating more and more alienation, even in the presence of that justified estrangement. So the reunification needed to happen because there had been a break between in contact between mom and dad and the child. But then when they got back together again and dad wanted to assert his rights to see his child, mom was still living seven years earlier and blaming him for all the things and continuing to say he was dangerous, even though that was not the case. And so um, there may be a, a crossover even in the face of justified estrangement that parental alienation rears its ugly head. The, the last kind of ground rule that I want to make sure that we all understand and that um, I want to set out is that I'm a full believer in the five factor model. Um, and you may be very aware of those things, those five factors from previous, but let me just tell them really briefly. A child refuses or rejects a relationship with a parent. There is a previous documented history of a relationship. So they had had something going on and then all of a sudden they're rejecting them. There's no abuse or neglect, or as we just spoke of justified estrangement or justification. There's use of multiple alienating behaviors and they may, the child may exhibit many of the eight behavioral manifestations of alienation. And so those are the ground rules that, we, that I, I wanted to just establish as we begin to talk about these mild, moderate and severe. So let's look at that continuum of alienation and what that looks like. First, mild, mod, mild alienation. And that happens when a child resists contact with the target parent, but enjoys the relationship once he or she is in the care of the target parent, of that parent that they, that they are rejecting. And so many of these families start out as, as mild, even in, in the intact family, but they, um, many times we notice it when there's a divorce or, or a separation from the family, which gives them a very clear, uh, the target parent a very clear understanding and clear view of what's going on. But, so that child may do things like, you know, not want to get in the car or consistently be late getting his things together to go with the other parent. Um, or, you know, once they're together, they're, you know, in the car, he's mopey going to the home of the target parent. But once they're together again, usually by the end of the first night, you know, uh, the first couple of hours, they stop the resistance, they get back into the flow, they remember the relationship they had with that parent, and they relax and get into, into um, a good relationship once they're there. They enjoy that time together. That, that separation may also happen prior to them going back to the other parent, the favorite parent, as they relive those things. The characteristics that we see in the child, as you can imagine, the child is very confused. He's very torn. He experiences uh, increased anxiety many times. There may be an increase in behavioral issues, child being a little more defiant, uh, a little more moody. There may be some acting out behaviors, but the child still feels guilty. There's still that tug back between, I, I like my this parent, but I don't wanna be with them. I shouldn't be with them. And there's, they're still feeling guilty about their behaviors acting out um, when they transition to that parent. And the child has difficulty in transitioning. They're trying to make sense of it. And this is where we, we see that the child begins to feel torn loyalties. Do I love mom? Do I love dad? Is it okay to love mom and dad together? You know, what's going on? And so they start to feel that pull, which is really creating some internal strife for them. So what we do with those parents, the kind of the reset that we look at is that we, parents receive education about the effects on the child. It's my firm belief that, that if healthy parents are in child's life, neither one of them, if they're healthy, would choose to hurt their child. And so many times giving them education about the effects that they are imposing on their child, what the physical, the psychological, the emotional effects, the brain effects of chronic stress um, happens with the child, many times that education gives them a, a wide opening about what's going to happen. Another part of that intervention is getting the parents to commit to supporting each other as parents, that they both have value for the child and they make a commitment to that parenting. Many times these parents can continue to co-parent. 
And it's important that parents show a united force for the child in the presence of the child. So to correct that, that resist and refuse beginning that had started and that um, mild alienation that is starting, it's important that the child view parents as two people who are getting along together for their sake. And so that's, that's a very key thing. I'm very surprised many times I, I have families that come in and we give them education and they see what they're doing and they decide that they're not going to do this to the child. Still have a lot of um, hostility towards each other, but not in front of the child. And they're very clear about that. And I've paired that with the fact that many times we have parents who have not, our, their children have not seen them interact in a positive way for years. We had twin boys that came in that were part of our program. And the twin boys, one went with mom and the other one went with dad during the separation period. And the alienation had started. Dad wanted both boys to stay with them. And um, we had kind of gone through the education about what this is doing with their to their children. And they made a conscious decision that they were gonna try to really work together in front of their children. When we saw the boys the next week um, after they had been with both parents for a period of time, they were getting along better. The boys themselves were getting along better. And we had them talk about what had happened. And they were surprised because they said for the first time, their parents actually showed up in the same place at the same time and were civil to each other. It happened to be at school and they actually said, hey, how are you doing? Very simple. But the parents got to see a united force, a child got to see a united force of the parents in the presence of the child. It's very powerful. During this mild stage, there's some missteps that can happen, okay? Um, especially in the midst of divorce. You know, there is an, a logical time sometimes, you know, during those first couple months of divorce and, and splitting up where things are pretty chaotic. And it's easy for a parent to kind of align. The other parent is out of the house and it's hard to not align with the child and to share more with the child and share maybe some things that are inappropriate, right? And that may be some of the first signs that there's mild alienation, that the child is is taking care of one parent because they feel badly for that parent. Um, and, but during this time, the insistence in co-parenting might not be the best thing for the family. There needs to be a cool out time where the children are not part of um, that, that uh, struggle. If parents can co-parent without the children being the, the focus of negative behaviors, great. But if they can't do that, then maybe they just need to do what they need to do on their time. We call that parallel parenting. Parent does what they need to do on their time and the other parent does the same. And there's not a forced kind of co-parenting communication if they can't handle it then. So looking at what's best for the child over what those parents see. And sometimes that's difficult for a parent to see because they, everyone wants the end result of a divorce to be, or many people do, the end results to be, we get along, we, we co-parent well, and there may be times during, especially in the midst of that divorce where that's difficult. So don't force that issue. Choosing a therapist that does not know parental alienation. If this is the beginning of a pattern of behavior that's escalating, it's important for that therapist to know about parental alienation. Another misstep that we see sometimes is that there are litigation traps. People get involved in litigation. They shut down communication. They're, everything is a, a, a motion to, do, to counter something that one parent has done against the other parent. And litigation does not help parents be, be good parents for the most part. Um, and especially when you've got a parent who is starting um, to starting to feel the effects of some parental alienation or that parent is escalating that parent, parental alienation. Many times during this, this period, parents don't wanna make it any worse or one parent who may be as healthier in dealing with the situation um, may try to do things that overcorrect. For example, um, I had a, a dad and a mom who came to me and they were in the midst of a divorce. They decided they were gonna try to co-parent. They weren't getting along. The alienation had started. It was in a mild stage. And dad just wanted to please the other parent and was agreeable to a fault. It was a big misstep on his part. He agreed to anger management, even though he didn't think he had a problem. 
Um, but he agreed to because because the mom thought he had a problem. And so he went to anger management. He, uh, along with that, agreed to have somebody supervise his visitation, even though he had a great relationship with his daughters prior to this. And so he agreed to some things to kind of get co-parenting going. But in the end of the, uh, the end of the story is that he created some problems for himself in the litigation by establishing the fact that he had um, anger management issues and he had uh, supervised visitation for his children. Next week on Families Divided, Christine Turner will join us for part two of her presentation to discuss more serious moderate and severe cases of alienation. When we return, Elaine Cobb talks with an author about her personal experiences in being an alienated child. Parental alienation is sad. When parents can't arrive at a solution amicably, it may be time to seek legal help for the sake of the children involved. In Florida, that's when you should contact Sparkman Law, specializing in litigating and defending complex and severe cases of parental alienation. Contact Shazia Sparkman, founder and managing attorney of Sparkman Law. Learn more at sparkmanlawfirm.com. At Victor's Crown, our focus is on you, our clients. When you arrive, our goal is that you will feel at home from our welcoming atmosphere to our serene surroundings. Everything we do at Victor's Crown is done with our clients in mind. We have comfortable seating areas for both adults and children. A large screen TV with surround sound where clients can be occupied with wholesome entertainment while they wait. We offer complimentary refreshments such as coffee, tea, water, and snacks. Due to the present COVID pandemic, our in-person appointments are restricted to selected cases, and those are held in our luxurious outdoor open-air meeting space that we affectionately refer to as the COVID cabana, which was built specifically for our clients to offer them the most comfortable and relaxing outdoor space available. All our other clients are offered secured web-based telemed sessions where they can connect with us from anywhere in the world. We're here today with Despina Mavridou, and she is in Greece, and she has written a book called Mom, Dead, Can You Hear Me? This is really a good book, and I'm glad she's able to join us today to speak to you about that. Hello, Despina. Hi, Lynn. I'm really happy to be here with you. We are so happy to join, you're joining us too, because we had such great response from your success story. We wanted to bring you back so you could speak a little bit to us about your book. So um, can you tell us what inspired you to write this book? Yes, of course. Uh, two things actually inspired me to write the book. The first one is the fact that I am a kid of separated parents. And I always wanted to say certain things to my parents when I was young, but I never had the courage to do it. So I wrote the book in order to express my feelings in a way. The other th thing that inspired me is the fact that I am a mediator for family dispute issues. And I have seen many times uh, during the mediations that the parents, even though they are trying to do the best for their kids, it is really difficult for them to really get in their kids' shoes and understand their needs and their feelings. So I wanted to write a book to show them the divorce through the eyes of their kids. Pretty much then, you're, you're wanting to write this book to them, correct? It's for both, actually. It's because mm -hmm. on one hand, I want to help children realize that um, divorce is something that happened also to others children, they, they are not uh, alone in this, and that uh, also that they, it is possible to, buy, to find the balance following a divorce, because many times the kids are still afraid, angry, confused, and they are afraid that they will lose uh, one of the parents. So I wanted to create a, a story to reassure them that it is possible to, to find the balance following a divorce. And I'm also writing the book for the parents because I want the parents to realize how the kid feels when they are put them in the middle, how angry they feel, the frustration, the confusion they have, so as to understand a little bit their behaviors and 
maybe try to change them if they find, for example, similarities. Right. Well, it really touched my heart. I know I've read it twice, as I mentioned to you, and uh, it, it is a very inspirational book. What do you hope, Despina, that people will get from uh, reading this book and understanding it? Well, I hope for the parents to understand the, how difficult it is for their kids and how hard it is when they are putting their kids in a situation where they have to choose sides, for example. Mm -hmm. And for the kids, I want them to understand that they can really express themselves and uh, communicate to their parents what they really need, which actually the most important thing for the kids is to have both parents in their lives. And, uh, but it is difficult for the kids to communicate this to their parents because most of the times they are afraid that they will lose one of them. So they are trying to satisfy them and saying different things to each other. For example, they are saying to the dad something, and after that, they are saying to their mom the completely opposite, mm. because they only want to please both of them. So I want them from the story to understand that they can communicate exactly what they need from their parents, and eventually the parents will understand and they will find a way to communicate and make the divorce easier for the kids. And even to this day, as an adult, and now that you're married and um, have a blessed little girl um, and are happy, you still suffer through this too, don't you? Yes. I mean, it took me a lot of years to find a balance in my life. It took me a lot of years to communicate again with my dad, because as you know, I, I didn't communicate with him for more than 20 years. Yes. And uh, all the things and the emotions that uh, divorce created in me when I was young, I carried them with me for many, many years. And this created many problems uh, in my relationships, even for my jobs. And it didn't it let me evolve as a person. Yeah, the scars are there. And that's what's so sad. Mm -hmm. But the best part is you did reuni uh, reunify with your father and um, that is most important. And now, uh, even though you lost all those 20 years, do your best to try to make it up. I know it's, it's almost impossible, but, and share that little baby and, and let him be a part of his grandchild's life. That is so important. And um, I do want to thank you, Des Despina, for sharing all of this with us. And if you wouldn't mind, would you hold your book up? Because I have the mm -hmm. first uh, the first printing and my my cover is different from your now cover. Could you show us that yes, your book, definitely. please? Just hold it up. Yes. And um, this is a really good book, folks. You're going to want to get it, and it's available. I know on Amazon. Mom, Dad, can you hear me? So um, it's it's not an expensive book. So please get it and 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 share it with others. 